We welcome you to Pensacola First Assembly of God tonight and believe in God to give us a wonderful time in his word and in his presence. As Pastor Lee has asked me to fill in for him tonight and he's told me he would probably be in the air at this particular time, flying in, flying in I believe, and uh, we just want to Minister, want to remember Pastor Lee and that God would minister to him the, the doctor's visit that he has around about this time of year so let's hold up your pastor and his family tonight that God would minister to our pastor this evening uh, we want to share some prayer, prayer requests with you our sister Enfinger is not able to be with us tonight so let's remember her in your prayer sister Kim Singleton Elizabeth Sessions Judy Holloway brother Avon Fowler Sister Lisa Kent and Grace Ross. Also, we want to let you know to, con to continue to remember the family of Colleen Strout, who will, the service will be tomorrow, the 17th, at Trahan Funeral Home over on Industrial Boulevard, which is over there in Car City. Uh, the visitation will be at 10 o'clock. The funeral will be 11 o'clock. Pastor Lee will be doing that service, so please keep that family in mind. Um, just uh, also want to pass on a couple of announcements to you as well. Our guest worship leaders for the next two weeks, Shannon and Denise Palmer, where are they at? There they are right there. Praise God. Give them a good hand. They're going to be with us in worship, and you will enjoy a time in the presence of the Lord. I can tell you that right now. I've known these folks for many, many years, and uh, they are a blessing to the body of Christ, and uh, you will you will. They'll take you there. They know where the presence of the Lord is, and they'll take you there for sure. Um, they also have contributed eggs for missions on our fresh eggs table. Please pick some up for a suggested donation of $5. Senior adult will be Friday night. All seniors are invited to join us at 6 p.m. And while Brother Lee is not here, we want to remind everyone to, that Pastor Appreciation it's going to be on Sunday, November 3rd. Please keep that in mind, and please remember your pastor with an offering or whatever you feel led of the Lord to do to honor the man of God. He is certainly worthy of that honor because he preaches the word of God. He's a man that holds the standard of God's word, and he's a great pastor of this church. And so we need to do everything that we can to honor him and his family for their sacrifice and their love to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. So remember that. Let us stand this evening, if you will, and, and take the needs before the Lord in prayer and believe God to minister to all of these needs tonight. How many of you have an unspoken request tonight, but uplifting hand? God knows exactly where you are. He knows the need that you have. Let's join together in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your blessings tonight, Jesus, in this house of worship, Lord. We come, Lord, as a people united together Believe in you, God, to minister to the needs, Lord, of all of your people, all of these needs, God, that have, been, that have made requests known. Lord, we pray that you would touch each and every life tonight, God, with your healing power, with your strength, Lord, and with your peace, God, tonight. We lift up, Lord, everyone God has a need in their body, a physical need, financial needs, spiritual needs, Lord. You're the God that can change any situation. And you can minister to the lives of all those that are here tonight. God, we commit this service to you, and we ask that, God, your presence and your spirit would minister to the needs tonight that are in this house. Lord, let the word of God go forth tonight, and let it accomplish its purpose in the life of your church tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated tonight. Praise the Lord. Have your Bibles, if you will, please. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 16. We want to spend some time in the Word of God tonight on the subject of the Bible, God's signature. The Bible, God's signature. I thought this, this evening, just a few moments ago, just as I looked at this again, where would I be tonight without God's Word? Now think of that for a moment. 
Where would I be tonight without God's word? I'm thankful for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and be able to come to worship together as a body of believers. And we need to do that every time the doors are open. But tonight, I brought the word into this house. And tonight, I'm taking that word home. I'm taking it home in here, and I'm taking it home physically. Where would I be? What would I do without God's word? And yet there are people overseas that would beg for just a page of this. I've seen a picture of, of missions uh, giving out Bibles, and they opened up the cases of Bibles to give out, and throngs of people ran to get the word of God. We live in a time, ladies and gentlemen, tonight where the Bible is being attacked, however. And I speak of, and I'm not, I don't want you to take what I'm going to say to you tonight in the wrong way because I'm not here to sell you a Bible. I'm not here to sell anything tonight. I'm here to just to bring forth God's word to your life. And, and tonight, I want to speak along those lines of God's word being the signature. And at, at the end of this lesson tonight, I think you'll know what God's signature is when you begin to look at some things in this study. But I've watched over the years in ministry and even out of full-time ministry of God's Word being attacked. And what I mean by that is the King James Version of the Bible being attacked, being coming against. We live in a society, we live in a world today that, looks at, doesn't, that doesn't look at this Bible the same way as they used to. And some in the church don't look at it the same way they used to either. It's, it's, it's almost like it's just a, it's a part of the furniture. It's just there, it, you know, that kind of thing. And, and it suffers attack after attack. One of the major denominations in our land has decided to go, you know, as far as the word of God being attacked, they just decided to close the, close the Bible entirely to what's right and wrong. And, uh, other denominations have done that too over the years, accepting sin to be the, the thing they're going to do, they're going to ordain, they're going to whatever they, that they do to that, and meanwhile putting the word of God aside so that they can bring others in and they can endorse whatever they so desire to endorse. That's the kind of world we're living in right now, where leadership of denominations are putting everything in God's word to question and we, we live in a time today where you could say that, that it's, it's, it's being redefined. It already is being redefined pretty much, but that's, that's what's happening here. And, you know, and, and I understand there's, there's new versions that we have in the Bible. I have a few of them myself at home. And I know that they're all, and most of the time in leadership right now, we're getting at a place where it seems to me, and I may be wrong because I'm not in the loop of a lot of things like I used to be, but it seems to me like the, every denomination besides the King James Bible is lifted up. It's, it's endorsed. And, you know, and if you have one, I'm not telling you to go and do anything. We, if you have your Bible, that's fine. I'm not telling you what to do with your Bible. I'm not, this is not that type of message. But I am saying this, that it seems like in the church age that we're presently in, any new version coming out, they're going to lift up. And the standard of God's word that, that, that for all these years is suddenly the enemy. Can you say amen? Suddenly it's something that's, that's brought into question that, you know, we really don't need that much anymore. The saints of God of old, if I can just say this tonight, the saints of God of old that had a rock-solid relationship with the Lord and lived for the Lord had in all of their possessions a King James Bible. They had that. You go back and look at history of this church or any church, any Pentecostal church, you'll see that Bible that was beside that saint of God. And, and whenever, I, whenever there's saints of God that are near and dear to me that I love very much, and many of them are going home to be with the Lord, but they had one thing in common. They had that Bible by their side, and that's what they lived by, and that's what their life was based upon. And now that 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 same Bible is kind of being left behind, so to speak, by the, by the church age as a whole. And many, many of them, I, in many years ago, I've heard stories about this. I've never seen it with my own eyes. 
But there would be saints of God who didn't have an education, that could not read, that could not write. They came down to the altar. They got saved. Jesus came into their heart and their life, and suddenly they opened up this Bible and began to read for the first time. Now, how does that happen? Supernaturally. They could read God's Word. What a thing to do. What a miraculous thing that is to not be able to read and then to be able to read God's Word. I spoke in, in, in speaking about these other versions of the Bible. I, I was doing some research uh, several months ago just for a particular version that I, want, that I was trying to find out the history of. And this, is just, this shows you the difference between the two ver, the versions that we have here. And uh, I was calling her to find out some church history or some history about the particular version they had. And I began to talk to her a little bit, and she said, well, this, you know, here's the name of the person, that kind of thing. So I started looking it up. And I said, while I have you on the phone, I said, I just have one question to ask you before you get off the phone. I said, explain to me Romans 8 and 1. And I said, what about Romans? And she said, what's about Romans 8 and 1? I said, why do most of the translators, the new translations, cut that scripture in half? If you don't know what that mean, what that says, it says this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Here's a newer version. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Did we leave something out? Something about halfway point is cut off, right? Okay. I know I have some of these Bibles. I, I know where the cutoff is there. I, I, I know what, you know, some of these are. And so I said, so why is that? And she spoke to me and she said, the scholars determine. I said, okay, the, the scholars who? She said, our board of scholars determine what's relevant. In God's Word. I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't want anybody telling me or cutting anything off of God's Word. I want the whole enchilada. Can you say amen? I want everything of God's Word, not your version of it, not his version of it. I want the whole counsel of God's Word. I can tell you that the church is in the condition it's in right now is because we don't have the whole God. Well, Brother Mike, does that really matter? Yes, it does. It absolutely does. Go to the store. You want to go get a gallon of milk. You come out the store, you get half a gallon, you're going to be upset. You, don't, you go down to the dealership, get a new car. You want a whole car. You want a half car. What, how much other car do you want? Can you say Amen. When it comes to God's word, I want the whole thing. And the church needs the whole thing, and you and I need the whole thing. We don't need the word of a scholar. We need the word of God. Can you say amen? There is more to this Bible than you think or than you see on the surface. You know, we live in the area of Florida. And we go, everybody has to cross the bridge probably before you get here, I'm sure. One or two, or if you don't, then you must have a straight course to Pensacola first. But most of us have to cross a bridge or two to get here. When you look out upon that water, you see the surface of Pensacola Bay, the Scambia River, or the Gulf of Mexico. We never, see, we never look underneath unless you've dived in the in the Gulf or whatever you've done, most of the time, we just see the surface. Most of the time in this journey with the Lord, all we're seeing is the surface of God's Word. Church, let me just tell you something tonight. There is so much more underneath it. There is so much more underneath God's Word. There, there are patterns in, in this Bible that, that 
that repeat themselves over and over again that gain the attention of that should gain the attention of the believer and that's what this study is about tonight Isaiah 40 and 8 and these are some scriptures that I put about God's Word because this is our basically our foundation tonight of God's Word Isaiah 40 40 and 8 it says the grass withereth the flower fadeth but the word of our God shall stand forever. Did you see that? That means it stands now, it stands tomorrow, it stood 100 years ago, it's going to stand a few thousand years from now. The word of God will stand. Governments are going to fall, Hollywood's going to fall, this world is going to fall, but the word of God's going to stand. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And I think, it's, I think it's interesting that he says, my words, not the words of an author or even a Bible scholar, but my words, talking about the word of God. Matthew 5, 18, for very last say unto you, to a heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass away from the law to all be fulfilled. Those, are the, those writings there, and there's many others found in God's word, this tells you, this gives us the description of what the Bible is. And there are many other scriptures that point to that. Now, let's get into a little bit of history. Because on May the 2nd, 1611, the King James Version of the Bible was published. It is the most authoritative, accurate, an authentic text. And you'll find that out here in just a few moments. While there are other versions of the Bible, and there are, the King James Bible stands above and beyond any and all others. It is estimated that between five and seven billion copies have been sold throughout history. That's a bunch of Bibles. There are countries today that want Bibles. There's ministries that are giving Bibles out. I support a ministry that my family and I do, and we, where we send them offerings each month, and they purchase Bibles to give away. So the, 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 these Bibles that, that God's Word given out is something that is very, very much important, and it's very much needed in the world that we live in today. Now, when you look at the number 1611, 1611 is the year that the Bible came into being, King James came into being. That's the year. Now, when you look at the 1611, you would say, well, it's just, it's just a year number. But as I've looked into God's Word, there's a little bit more to that number 1611. Can you say that with me tonight? Now remember that number. 1611. Deuteronomy 16 and 11. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you. In the place which the Lord thy God had chosen to place his name there. Now that's important. In the place which the Lord thy God had chosen to place his name there. The word of the Lord in this particular passage of scripture, the word Lord is the seventh and the 49th word in Deuteronomy 1611. Seven is the number of completion. Seven times seven is 49. Did you look at the paper? Some of y'all didn't. You looked straight at me and said 49. Seven is a very important number in God's word. You'll find this out when you begin to look at this. The number of completion. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Old Testament. 
the 1,611 mention of the word Lord is in Deuteronomy 16.11. Is that a coincidence? Did that just happen to fall or drop together? Now think about this for, for a moment. This is not a Bible scholar that's writing this. This is not a preacher putting this together. This is God Almighty. What are, if, if you were to, you know, what are the odds of that? Would it be a trillion to one, something like that? More than that? Who knows? But the odds of that happening with any of us is slim and none. And the question that I have that I pose to all of you tonight in this room, could God be behind this? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so tired of the flesh. Let me get to where the Spirit of God is. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. So, if I've heard you right, you don't believe in this place that this is a coincidence. I heard amen on that. So, what about y'all on this side? Okay. So, this is no coincidence, right? All right, so stay with me. All right? In the 1611 King James Bible, King James Bible, it is the first time that the word Lord was differentiated between the word Jehovah, Lord in uppercase, and Adonai, Lord in lowercase. Now, if you go back and look at that word again, what previous page at the bottom, you'll see there. You go back and look where it says, at the bottom of that scripture, in the place which the Lord thy God had chosen to place his name there. The 1611 writing or the printing of the word of God, the King James Bible, they put the Lord there for the first time. You see, God himself, without our help, will fulfill his word. God will fulfill his word. Let me get back to my place. The first time it's differentiated is in the 1611 King James Bible. This is important. When, when, when it concerns God, it's like, it's, it's almost as if in this particular year, God has chosen to reveal himself. He's chosen to say, I'm Lord. But I, I, I just don't want you to hear this. I want to put it in print that says, I'm Lord. I was Lord before this, but now you have it in print. Okay. Let's go to Acts 16.11. You have your Bibles? Turn there, please. Acts 16.11. We're going deeper. Now, I, I, was, I will be the first to tell you this. I have read this scripture many multiplied times in just reading the Bible. You know, this, this, the reading I do that, you know, our, our family has, my wife has a reading plan. I don't, I, I have my own plan, so to speak, you know, reading so many chapters today. I can't tell you, and, and I read somewhere in the neighborhood about three to four times a year that I go through, through God's word. I'm not telling you that for any bragging purposes. Just, just to let you know the repetition of my reading, and I know probably you do as well. But I would have, 
if I were to just see this verse as it is, I would say, okay, it looks like a missionary trip, and they're going several places. Then turn the page. But a little bit more is happening here. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. Now, I've tried to, and I know I appreciate the folks here that put, that put this printer, and it's, actually you have a colored map there that we'll see that we'll refer to here in just a moment. But it's important to note that in the midst of this trip right here in Acts 16, 11, that the Apostle Paul has already been instructed by the Holy Spirit to not to go to Asia and not to go to Bithynia. And I believe that there's, there's a purpose as to why the Holy Ghost is in the midst of this journey with the Apostle Paul. There's a reason why. God is wanting to reveal himself on this trip, as we'll see in a little while. So the Holy Spirit working, working with the Father, working with the Son, can you say amen? The Trinity is working here and guiding the Apostle Paul. No, I don't want you to go there, and no, I don't want you to go over there either. I want you to go this way. And I fully believe, I, I, I didn't get this till the other day, but I fully believe that God was trying to, to get the Apostle Paul on the track where God could reveal himself to the Apostle Paul and the others in the boat. And listen to me tonight. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God sometimes will put you on a trail, on a path, in a place for you to know who he is so that he can reveal himself to you. So if you're wondering sometimes, what in the world am I on this road for, Lord? Don't question it. Just keep on riding. Now, this is just a small verse with three places mentioned. Acts is the book of church history and the fifth book of the New Testament. And we've already spoken about the Holy Ghost in the midst of this journey, leading, guiding, directing, to show something greater than just a place on the map. The journey is to Troas, then to Samothracia, and then to Neapolis. On this boat, because Paul is not by himself, is Timothy, Silas, and Luke. Paul and Luke together wrote 16 books of the New Testament with Luke writing with Luke writing 2 and Paul 14. Okay, you with me? All right. On the boat, there are 16 books. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Entering into Europe for the very first time. And you have 11 books that are not on the boat of Acts 16, 11. Can you see that? So 16 is on the boat, and 11 are not on the boat. Now, if you've got to just, uh, this is, you can't put this together. There is no group of preachers that can put this together. <laughs> there is no board, there's no, nobody can put this together. This is the hand of God. 16 books in the boat, 11 books not on the boat. Oh, praise God. And it's important to look at this, too, that they are entering into Europe for the very first time, praise God, on the missionary journey. All right. The first time in the entire Bible that a man of God stepped foot into Europe. Neapolis is what it was known as, which is in northern Greece. The first time. 
When the Apostle Paul and this group stepped into Europe, they were taking Jesus Christ with them. Can you say amen? Amen. The Bible says, and the next day to Neapolis. Now, the word day in this verse that we just read is the 1,611th time the word day or days appears in the New Testament. Could that be a coincidence too? There's nobody in this room that believes coincidence. How, is, how, 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 how could this be? Only by the hand of God. If I was a crime scene investigator, if I'm not, I believe you could look around and see the fingerprints of God all over the thing. Oh, hallelujah. The fingerprints of God, church, are on this Bible right here. Hallelujah. Praise God. 1,611 times. It just happens to be on the word day that just happens to be in Acts 1611. Oh, hallelujah. There's no way that can be anything but God. Now, if you look at this, Troas, Samothracia, and Neapolis are all three in a direct line to London, England. When you look at that map, that second map there, you'll see that. Why is that important? That's because that's where the King James Bible would be printed in 1611. So you see, when they departed, it was a straight course to where the 1611 Bible would be printed in London, England. You see, God's over the whole entire navigation of this thing. All of it. The island of Samothracia, only mentioned in Acts 1611. If you look at your map, you can see that little island there. It's to the right there. It's not a very big, big thing. That It's not a big island whatsoever, but it's a very small place. But that little small place, that little small island, had a mountain. That mountain was Mount Fingari, and it was used by the sailors and the ship navigation due to its height and its prominence. The height of Mount Fingari is 1,611 meters high. I'm sure that's a coincidence. <laughs> I'm sure they got that wrong. When you begin to look at God's Word, you see something more. I think that's what the Holy Spirit of God is trying to let us know tonight. That there is so much more to His Word. So much more. I can remember years ago, having not been saved that long, the devil was tormenting my mind to beat all, especially at night. So one night I decided to do something different. I took my Bible and I took it to bed. And I held it by my side for the entire night. And after that night, there was no more problems. God intervened. The things that you're going through in your journey with the Lord, 
the thing that the devil is going to attack most is this right here. So hide this in your heart, the Bible says, that, uh, that you might not sin against him. Hide the word in your heart. Hide the word of God in your life. Well, Brother Mike, that's, that, that, that was, you know, that's good for you. No, it's good for all of you. You say amen? This is the word of God, and it is for your life. And so many people tonight run to it in the bad times. We need to run to it in the good times, too. If you got money in the bank, read your Bible. If you're living off your savings account, read your Bible. If you got a zero balance, still read your Bible. Amen. Through the good times, through the hard times, God's word remains the same. The mysteries of this life that you go through, that I go through, that we go through. I can't give an explanation for them or why I went through it or why you went through it. But I know that God's word never fails. I talked to a lady the other night who had a, who's, who's a family member of hers was about to pass away. Just offered prayer to her over the phone, believing God to minister to the need of her life. She, did, she didn't know what she needed, but I knew from just to hearing the tone of her voice that she needed the Lord. And listen to me not church. The church right now needs God's word more than you as a believer need, need God's word more now than you've ever needed it before. We must daily expose our lives to this, read this. We must daily have a plan to read God's word, to get in fellowship with that word each and every day day. Why? Because the battles out there are getting tougher and the adversary is coming in stronger than ever before. So you need to have the whole armor of God in and around your life. You can trust this tonight. You can trust his word. It's like when Pastor Lee has been going through the minor prophets and majoring on the minors for the past, I think, several weeks now. But can I tell you something, the interesting thing about God's word, that if Pastor Lee was to start over in that series again, I guarantee you there's more layer after layer after layer after layer and all that. Praise God. Heaven is going to be a place. Now, I've said, after reading God's word and serving the Lord for a period of time now, I've come to understand one thing, and that is one lifetime is not enough to find out who God is. One lifetime is not enough. When we get to that city whose builder and maker is God, the child of God, there's going to be a, it's going to be a place of discovery, I do believe. We're going to be in heaven. We're going to be discovering about, about God one billion years from now. Can you say amen? We, we can't handle everything that God, that God would desire to give us on this earth. This body, this mind, this spirit can't handle that. His word tonight, church, never fails. You can always count on it. I can remember being in hospitals, being in times when it was difficult, being in times when you're about to lose a family member. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes upon your life, and he gives you a word, and he lets you know that he's there. Folks, you can trust God's word always. And I know that we're living in a time, as I said before, where everything's against it and, and bombarding life situations and other things as well. But you can always go to it. You can always trust it. It is the foundation of your Christian life. It's the foundation of who we are as believers. We are the children of the Most High God. And folks, today, the battle that you're in right now, presently, is a battle between the adversary of your soul and the truth of this holy word right here. So the more truth you have in your, in your life and in your heart, the greater you're going to be able to stand against the adversary of your soul. When you leave this building tonight, take this Bible with you. 
when you get up in the morning, take that Bible in your hands. When you walk through the valley, hold on to the Word of God. When you're standing high on the mountaintop, hold on to the Word of God. When things are going right, hold on to God's Word. When things are going wrong, hold on to God's Holy Word. He will help you, He will strengthen you, and He will bless you. And He will show unto you what His Word and reveal His Word to your life. His Word will not return void when it comes into this heart, this life. So get into His Word each and every day. Can you say amen? I want you to stand tonight. Let's everyone come around this altar and pray together, if you will. We got a few moments before we. Things happen in our life. Battles take place in our life. Situations happen that we don't understand. But our God is able. And his word never fails. Praise God for that. I pray tonight that the next time you open up this Bible, you'll look underneath the pages of it. You'll consider that place. You'll consider what the Word of God has to say. Don't worry about, don't worry about it. We're not, you know, it, it, it would be like, I guess you could drop a marble in a well, so to speak, if you're one year old and you could do that. You still wouldn't hear the bottom many years later. That's the height and the depth of God's Word. Church, we need, as individual believers, this word in our hearts, our lives, every day. And I'm praying that God would just minister to your life and put his word in your life every day. But you've got to open up the pages of this Bible and read his word and let that word minister to you tonight. Let us pray. Father, tonight, God, we give you the praise and glory and honor tonight, Jesus, for this time in your word, Lord. I pray you bless this word unto your church tonight. I pray, God, that they would, as they go to, the, to you in prayer and as they open up that Bible, God, that it would just explode in the midst of their heart. God, let a revelation of you come forth into their heart, into their spirit, into their soul, into their life. God, minister to them your word in the good times and the bad times and the difficult times. Lord, today strengthen each and every believer in this house tonight with the word of God and let your spirit, God, surround them and minister to them and keep them. God, I pray tonight, Lord, we, we love you and we thank you, God, for your word tonight that's been committed unto us and we give you praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving tonight. Church, lift up your hands tonight and praise him. Father, we praise you, Lord, tonight for your word for the accuracy of it, God, for the love we have for it, Lord, and the love you have for us. We thank you for the word of God tonight, Lord, the Bible. Lord, let everybody walk out of this building tonight with it in their heart or in their hand. Lord, let everybody walk out of this building going towards where it is, Lord, tonight. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this church body tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you tonight. Praise God.